Okay, moving on to then uh, S7 or H716. If you would let them in, that would be great. Is that somewhere here in my file, Daphne? Um, let's see. Um, I think it's just one page uh, underneath the agenda. So it might not be a single file. This file is on page 716. Oh, okay. Yeah, Thank sorry. you. Right here. This is the one we keep getting emailed about. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking for uh, a Ms. Simmons, really, to kick us off. Is she not here? Not yet. Oh, there she is now. Great. There's the layout feature, so I'll get it all watching. Ms. Simmons, thanks for joining us. There we are. Uh, committee, we have been talking about H17, which is one of 716, thank you, which one of the pieces postpones uh, the implementation of uh, some special education language. Ms. Simmons, would you mind refreshing our memories uh, as it relates to what the postponement actually does? And then if you would weigh in, we know you've already been in here a little bit on this. And I think your message to the committee was there was no need to postpone. Uh, and we would then have a follow-up question around how do we get, one of the things we've heard from those testifying is, teachers and others need to be ready to implement this work and be trained. And we're wondering how the Agency of Education might do that. So that's a little bit of, uh, that's our request of you and uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Emily Simmons, Agency of Education. Yes, the house passed version of H716 um, does three things and two of those changes are about delay in special education roles. So I believe that's the question today. There were many, many changes in rule series 2360 made by the state board and that work was finished about a year ago. Several of those changes were not strictly required by Act 173, but were consistent with the state board's authority and the public comment received through rulemaking. A subset of those changes are the topic of the delay contemplated in the bill. They are changes to the rule about um, measuring adverse effect, which is part of the process of identifying whether a student will be eligible for special education. The other rule has to do with the procedures for identifying one category of special education, which is specific learning disability. So these are rules that are governing the process that an evaluation and planning team undertakes when there is a student being evaluated for special education. And it's really changing just two elements of a very comprehensive process and not every step or facet of that process is impacted by these rules changes. Very helpful. So how would the Agency of Education support the work that teachers and schools will need to do around this? Yes, so the Agency of Education has already pushed out professional development, professional learning on these and the other rules changes contemplated or adopted by the State Board last year. We have um, a team, our Student Support Services Division, who are providing that comprehensive training. A lot of it is available now online for viewing. It has been pushed out to the field and more of it is still in the final stages of development to be pushed out to the field. We um, could come back with a presentation of the specifics of that professional development that's been pushed out already and what's immediately forthcoming if the committee is interested. I unfortunately am not your expert on that. I'm aware of the broad strokes, but it's not my team. I think you'd be very happy that it's not the legal team that's primarily responsible for that professional learning. 
Uh, one question I have. Yeah, is there something we can do about that? Is that possible? Or, okay, thanks. Uh, how long does the professional training take to get teachers and others up to speed on what needs to be done? I might frame the professional learning differently and give you a little more context. There okay. are presentations about the rule change itself and there are presentations about implementation. However, all of this content is pushed out for supervisory union and supervisory district teams to digest and use in, at a leadership level, a central office level, if you will, to train the individual staff as they see fit in that system. So this is a little different than what some might assume, such as a one session where many educators are enrolled and the teacher is primarily the agency of education. What we're doing is sometimes called more of a train the trainer. So I don't know, I don't have the answer to your question, how long it takes the total number of minutes that are out there. But... Oh, she's frozen. Yeah. yeah. On this point, I'm not sure if you can hear me, Emily, but I, I talked to my lovely spouse who's a public school teacher and I said, would you think the week before this semester and the year begins is a good time just to put training in this? And she just sort of chuckled. She said, that's always a very, very hectic and busy time. So I, I think the length of this training is an important question, yeah. uh, just to be sensitive to our teachers and how stressed they, they are after this last two years of pandemic. So getting a good feel for how long this training is is useful. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a really good point. And uh, I'm also curious uh, when Ms. Simmons um, comes back to get a sense of her thoughts around the, what if, people get a sort of uh, either by requested extension only. You know, some districts might be ready to go, other districts might not be ready to go. And I'm wondering where uh, where she thinks the districts are in general. Senator Hooker. I, I'm um, wondering how different this is from the existing process to determine, you know, who is eligible for special ed. So, you know, what what is added to this? Who does it involve? Um, and again, going to the you know the length of time that it takes for the training. But how different is this from the system that's in place now? Ms. Simmons, is that something you can you can answer? And I'm so sorry. I'm having some internet problems because of weather, but I heard the question, how different is the changed rule from the former rule? The rules change is in regard to adverse effect is primarily dictating different data, different inputs from the student and their um, educational experience than the information and data that is relied upon now. So I, I think you've heard testimony, and I should be considered a layperson when it comes to the evaluation process. I know the text of the rule, but not the implementation. But the former adverse effect rule relied on very objective um, data measurements, test scores, for instance, numbers. The new rule is more characterized as more holistic and more subjective, sometimes that word has a negative connotation. In this context, educators have described it as looking more at the whole child than um, a cold set of numbers. So the training that has to be done, as I understand it, to make this shift is talking about how to collect the new, more comprehensive information data points and how to eval evaluate it, how to norm that use of information. Yeah, Ms. Simmons, we've heard testimony from folks, and I don't know if you've heard it or read it, that they're concerned about a harm that would be caused if we didn't delay. And I didn't know if, the, if, we, you did, could we, did, if we did delay. <laughs> so I, I want to know if, if the agency has an opinion or if you are worried about that you know, if, if, 
if we did delay, what kind of harm would be caused? But no, I guess my question really is from the people from the other side. The people that want to delay it, they said that if we if we put it in place on July 1st, that it will be kind of chaotic, that they'll have, we'll have inconsistencies between different districts because of their abilities. They might have already been doing it or they have ability to do the training better than other schools. So my question is, does AOE share these concerns or do you, do you feel that you have the capability and the trainers and the support mechanisms to bring the schools so that by the time school starts, they can do these evaluations in a way that won't cause harm to the children. Does that make sense that I get there yes. in the end? Okay. Yeah. That makes sense to me. <laughs> the harm, there are both, both advocates for and against delay see risks in not taking their preferred approach. So I think the advocates for delay primarily view the risks as um, unreadiness um, uneven implementation, and third, potential findings against the district as a result of its unreadiness. I can take that third one off the table a little bit. The Agency of Education's monitoring team is preparing to take a, and this is not an announcement of this policy, this is a plan policy that we're um, evaluating right now, just to a continuous improvement approach to these rules changes, a supportive approach to these rule changes rather than um, making findings against taking punitive action against districts in the first year because of their unreadiness. So I think to put it more simply than the way I just said, we're gonna be very understanding from a monitoring point of view around these rules and the fact that folks um, got ready very quickly for this rule change. We do always have concerns at the agency about uneven implementation. We know it's just a reality that some of our districts have um, more ability to pivot quickly than others. And it's gonna take longer for change to be implemented in some of our districts just because of their circumstances. So the agency is gonna have a lot of work to do to support all districts. We are in favor of going ahead with the rule change without delay because we feel ready to provide that support and believe we've already begun to provide that support and we'll be there for the field in time for this change to take place. Senator uh, Chittenden. Uh, Senator Percy, did you finish? No, no, okay. Well, was... Emily, what you just said really validates what, where my mind is currently going on this. Uh, I, got, I must say, I, uh, I asked last week what the, ca what the caution would be if we just allowed the schools to, to go that are feeling ready for this year but without penalty and making it clear that they can, uh, if they're not feeling ready and they need another year to allow for other school districts to, to take the delay. Uh, I, I'm of the opinion that that's the, the best way forward to, to enable each school district to choose how ready they are. The only uh, counter argument I heard was that that would be inequitable across districts. Uh, to that point, I already see inequities in the entrance age for kindergartens and, and how we have resource our schools that we're trying to address in other ways. But uh, what would you be your counter arguments against just uh, allowing and adjusting this language to make clear that districts that don't feel ready for this year can take a whole other year while at the same time allowing the schools ready to, to enact it this July 1st? I would really caution against that formal institution, you know, form formally giving different dates for different districts because we're talking about a federal educational entitlement that has enforcement in federal law so a, a parent who, is, um, who has a complaint has a federal dispute resolution process of administrative complaints or due process complaints. And we at the state can't do anything about disallowing that remedy. So what you would have is legal rights in one district that are different than the other district. A parent might have a claim against the state in a district that did not implement if their child experienced harm as a result of the delay in their district, because that's um, that could be seen as legally unequal treatment as a matter of state policy. So to follow up on that, if we allowed the language that came from the House over formally delaying a year, 
what would be the uh, problem with a school district that chose to adopt a year early? Would you would you say if we let this language go through and we let them delay for a year and a school district says, no, we're ready this year, would you caution them against doing so? They would be allowing more, very, very generally, they'd be permitting more special education than is legally required. So it is less likely that a parent would have an actionable complaint against them just because of the posture of how that change would take place. It still would be worth analyzing with their district council, whether it's prudent to go ahead with that change out in front of the formal policy change as a matter of state law. Didn't we hear testimony that at least one school is already doing this? And so they're already going ahead and they're using this this new form of doing the adverse impact test. At least that's what my understanding is. What's to stop them from doing so? Right. And they're not. So if we leave the delay, if I may. No, please, yeah. So if we leave the delay in place, acknowledging that some schools have already adopted these rules, let's delay it a year, but then if school districts are adopted early, what what what's the matter with that? I'm not seeing a downside to that. Would you repeat that question? So let's, if we accepted the house proposal yeah. to delay yeah. for a year, yeah. where is the downside with schools that feel ready and choose to adopt this coming year, this coming summer? Senator Persco. Well, there's, I don't think there's a downside for allowing the schools to go ahead and do it, but there's a downside for the students in the schools that delay a year because mm -hmm. they won't get the services that they need if just, if they, if the different way of, um, you know, measuring the child's needs, that year they'll they'll lose one more year of getting that additional service. So that would be the reason that I would want to be cautious. And I don't know how many schools we're talking. So if it was eighty percent would go forward and twenty percent didn't, that would be different than if it's two schools go forward and four hundred delay a year, because then that's a lot more students. I mean, that's the main argument that I hear from those that don't want to delay is that there's students that they feel would be harmed because they won't get the educational services that they need because they'll fail the adverse test. So they'll, the school will say, the student doesn't didn't meet the adverse impact. And so therefore we're not gonna give that student the services, but just next year they're gonna get the services under the more holistic approach. I mean, that's how I see the two sides. So I'm just, I'm trying to get my uh, thoughts around, you know, how is this kind of rolled out in a school and how long it takes to, to implement this? And are there time restrictions on, you know, like when kids have to be tested, when they're being monitored? I mean, what... I still don't understand really what it entails. I'm sympathetic to not wanting to put more on teachers and staff because of the pandemic and all, but what does it actually entail? And if we put it into motion as it was intended, then um, you know, does that mean that you know, people have to kind of rush to get this accomplished, I guess is you know, the question. Yeah. As soon as if you want to add anything from based on what you've heard. Listening to that comment, I'm very sympathetic to the committee not having full visibility into what's what's being offered to districts and where that puts them. I would offer that I think the committee would really benefit from testimony by Jackie Kelleher, the state director of special education, who's responsible for the professional development that's going out and who is a special educator. She could answer your questions more detailed. I'm sorry, I really sort of brought her today. And I, I feel that there's a lot she could bring to this conversation. We have her on the schedule uh, for some time this week. Jackie Kelleher? Not scheduled yet. Okay, okay let's have her in tomorrow. Okay. And she'll give us an idea of, of how people are trained, the, the length of time, all of that sort of thing. That would be very helpful. Okay. Uh, back to what you were saying regarding federal disputes. Are we then, are you saying that if we 
don't delay in something and for whatever reason a school or a teacher is not trained properly are we putting the school in some kind of jeopardy with regard to a penalty from the federal government the school is in jeopardy of having a complaint against it in that hypothetical it's um, the kinds of actions that come out when there is an administrative complaint um, in favor of the parent or a due process complaint in favor of the parent go to getting services to the student. So it's not an enforcement action by the federal government per se. It's a request for relief from the parent that would be granted by the, it's actually the agency of education that decides administrative complaints and independent hearing officers in Vermont who decide due process complaints and either neutral party can order reevaluation of the student, um, particular uh, actions of the school district remedies, you know, for the student's education. And then I think my final question is, do you have a sense of how many districts uh, are ready to go percentage wise with this? How many are not, or is this all new training that would happen? With regard to the adverse effect rule, there's more new there. This is different than the practices that would have existed in any school district prior to the new rule. With regard to the identifi identification of specific learning disability, there's less new there. Some districts were already voluntarily using an approach that is still permitted by the rule. Some districts were using an approach that is now disallowed by the rule. So that's the change there. I believe the data question is a good one for Jackie Kelleher. I'm not sure how the data collection by the agency is actually framed, but we do have some, so I think it's survey type information about district readiness. Any other questions for Ms. Simmons before we move on to other witnesses? So we'll look forward to hearing. Uh, Daphne will schedule uh, the individual you mentioned that can take, give us a sense of the training tomorrow. And in the meantime, uh, we'll continue right now hearing from uh, mostly parents and special education advocates uh, on where they stand as it relates to the delay. And let's start, if we may, we don't have any, thank you, with uh, Ms. Crenshaw. Hi, can you hear me and see me okay? Yes, welcome, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for um, hearing my testimony today. Um, I am a person with a disability, I have ADD, so unfortunately I have to read my testimony or else my brain won't process is what I'm trying to say. Um, but my name is Jamie Crenshaw. I'm a parent member of the Vermont Special Education Advisory Panel. I'm also a graduate, graduate of the Vermont Leadership Series. Um, I am a mother of two sons, ages 18 and 16, both of which have been diagnosed with dyslexia and dysgraphia. For today's testimony, I will be speaking as a parent and not as a representative of any organization. As stated in my March 18th written testimony, I do not support the delay in imp implementing Rule 2362 or Rule 2362.2.5. In my opinion, delaying the changes would mean that Vermont is choosing to will willfully be in defiance of the federal IDEA, IDEA law because we are denying students with disabilities the right of early identification and evaluation as afforded under IDEA. Section two of Bill H-716 is asking this committee to answer the question of whether our educators and staff have time to adequately prepare for delivery of special education services. And all honestly, I don't understand why this question is being asked. When the Vermont Board of Education approved the rule changes, they determined these changes were necessary. Through public comment, the Board of Education heard evidence that the language in the current Vermont rule 2362 was overly rigid and caused students to be found ineligible for special education services on a technical or formulaic basis, rather than the well-informed judgment of qualified special educators. This means that Vermont students with disabilities were being denied a free and appropriate education, an entitlement protected under the Individuals with Disabilities Act. It shouldn't matter that the changes came from public comment. It doesn't make it any less important. Sorry. 
showing my page. Um, 16 VSA 1657 states that our local education agencies need to ensure that students are furnished educational services in accordance with any state or federal entitlements. Early identification, evaluations, and special education and related services for students with disabilities are entitlements protected under IDEA. IDEA 300.101C states that each state must ensure that a free appropriate public education is available to any individual child with a disability who needs special education related service, services, even though the child has not failed or been retained or in a course or grade and is advancing from grade to grade. Significantly below grade norms means the 15th percentile or below. This is waiting for failure before supports are provided. Public comments also identified that the language in Vermont's current rule 2362 and 2362.2.5 also denied fate for students in the categories of disability, deaf blindness, and specific learning disabilities. Neither of these categories require an adverse effect on educational performance. The removal of adverse effect is especially important when it comes to fulfilling Vermont's goal set in 16 VSA 2903, preventing early school reading failure, reading intervention. The statute states, children who fail to read by the end of first grade will likely fall further behind in school. The personal and economic cost of reading failure are enormous, both while the student remains in school and long afterwards. The State Board of Education, in collaboration with the Agency of Human Services, Higher Education, Literacy Organizations, and others, shall develop a plan for establishing a comprehensive system of services for early education in the first three grades to ensure that all students learn to read by the end of third grade. A comprehensive system of services includes early identification, evaluations, and special education related services for students with specific learning disabilities, who by reason of under IDEA section 300.8 require special education and related services. IDEA section 300.8 requires that a child meet two prong tests to be considered a child with a disability. The child must have one of the specified 13 disabilities and they must, because of their impairment, need special education related services. How does the evaluation and planning team answer these two questions? And I'm hoping this will provide some of that, um, some of the questions, answers to the questions that you had asked. Um, they do it through the special education process. Of note, this is the process that many people have stated would require a significant practice change for any special educators. There are seven steps in the process. And from my understanding, only one step is impacted by the rule changes. The first step is referral or child find. And I'm not gonna go through what each one means. I'm only gonna explain the one that's being impacted. So the first one is referral or child find. Second one is review of existing information and data to determine if an evaluation is warranted. The third is consent for an evaluation. The fourth is evaluation data assessments and other information. This one is the most cr crucial when it comes to evaluating a child um, because this is where they, they collect all of the data on the the and information about the child. It comes from the general education teachers, it comes from special education teachers, anybody that has um, knowledge of that child has to be part of this data accumulated accumulation. Um, something. Uh, the comprehensive evaluation must provide information relevant to making decisions about how to educate the student so that they can access, engage, and make meaningful progress towards meeting age and grade level standards. The fifth step is evaluation findings, which is interpreting the data. Again, it's already in current law, nothing changes there. What is changing is step six, and that's the eligibility decisions. This is when the team determines eligibility. This is the step that is most impacted by the rule changes, but I believe it is positively impacted. The rule changes ease the restrictions on eligibility. The team may now make decisions relying on the evaluation data that's been collected and their expertise and knowledge. The decision around a child's eligibility is not always going to be the same from school to school, and it shouldn't be. Each decision must be made by the team on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the unique individual needs of a particular child, not based only on discrepancies in age or grade performance in academic subject areas. The last step is the evaluation report. And again, that's not impacted by the current, um, by the rule changes. The special education process, these seven steps will not and does not change regardless of which three identification methods is utilized. Um, the only step that is being impacted by the rule change is step six, the eligibility decision, which as others have stated, simplifies the process so that decisions made by the team 
are decisions that rely on the combined expertise and knowledge of each participant before the student fails. Therefore, I do not see how the changes in the rules would require a significant practice change for our special educators. The rule changes align with the intent of Act 173. The four main goals of Act 173 as they relate to services provided to all students who require additional supports are effectiveness of services, availability of services, equity of services, and supervisory union compliance with IDA and state law. This is what Secretary Dan French has to use to measure whether um, Vermont is effective in implementing Act 173. He has to use those four goals. The Ver Vermont Board of Education voted to approve rule changes so that Vermont would align, align with existing federal IEDA laws, and more importantly, to ensure a free and appropriate education to all its students, including students with disabilities before failure sets in. They also approved the rule changes so that Vermont could ensure the goals of Act 173 are implemented effectively. Bill H-716 has passed over to your committee. The bill suspends the implementation of rules 2362 and 2362.25 until July 1st, 2023. The sole intent of the delay is to allow educators and staff time to adequate, adequately prepare for the delivery of special education services. To the, delay the implementation of the rules is not only a violation of student rights to equal education access, but is in my opinion unnecessary. The special education process has existed in the federal I, IDEA law since it was last reauthorized in 2004. Determining specific learning disability eligibility using a model based on whether the student responds to scientific research-based interventions has also existed in the state of Vermont special education rule since it was adopted in June 13, June 13, 2013. The multi-tiered system of support was implemented in 2014. This means that Vermont educators and staff should already be fully trained and knowledgeable in determining disability eligibility. This includes using the response to intervention method. There should be no ambiguity or any significant professional development when implementing the new rule change. In closing, I ask that this committee consider removing section two from H716. It is critical that Vermont special education regulations align with federal IDEA and that the existing provision of a free and appropriate education for children with disabilities be retained. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Uh, and you have submitted your testimony? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, I kind of just got it down what I wanted to say this morning, but sure. I can it up. I can make it more formal and send it in if you'd like. That would be terrific. That would be a big help if you would send it to uh, Daphne. Thank you. Sure. Uh, can, I, can I add is, one thing? Yes, can please, I add go one ahead. Thing? Um, I just want to say that when it comes down to determining eligibility, the um, education of agen agency, education, Agency of Education um, back in 2016 created an adverse effect chart. This chart, yeah. and I can send it to you, this chart um, has the measures that educators must use um, when determining. It has different examples of tests that they can use. Um, and then it has a criteria for comparison. The only thing that is changing within the entire process is the criteria that people are using to determine eligibility. Everything else is exactly the same. Um, so I, I, I don't understand how this is such a big process within our schools. Okay, Senator Persley. A quick question. Um, you had mentioned a few disabilities that, that don't need to have the adverse impact designation. Can you? Yes. Line, I can't um, said it. Which ones were those again? It's specific learning disability and uh, deaf blindness. Um, okay. If you look, and this is in my first testimony that I sent on March 18th. If you look at the definitions of those disability categories, there is not an adverse effect. Every other disability category says within their definition that they have to have adverse effect on their educational performance. These two disability types do not have that written in there. Therefore, when it comes to determining eligibility, they have to see, does this child fall under this disability category as defined by 300.8? And if they do, they use that information they drew from all of the different assessments and they say, do they need special education services? And it's important to note that the team should be looking at whether or not that child could make up the deficit, the, the reduce the gap that, that's been created between he and his peers, they and their peers, um, within the special education classroom. Um, because that is the big question is, do they need additional supports in order to reduce that gap? 
Um, and if it can't be done within the general education classroom, then it has to be required by special education if they fall under, you know, a child with a disability and they need special education. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, feel free, Ms. Crenshaw, to stay on. We're going to move to uh, Ms. Ballard. Uh, we do have, uh, we're, we're hoping to hear from everyone in the next 15 minutes. So if, if one way to think about it is, do you have new information to share uh, as it relates to this issue? Thank you so much. And I apologize, my camera's off. My internet is not working very well. Okay, so no my problem at all. Just... Great. I'm going to read really quickly. I wrote something so that I could stick to okay. the timeline and hopefully be very quick. So good afternoon and thank you to Chairman Campion and the rest of the committee for taking the time to hear from myself, Jamie, San and Sandra. In an effort to be concise and not repetitive, I'm going to try and keep my testimony brief, but I want to echo that I agree with the points Jamie and Sandra will or have made today. And I am here today to strongly advocate against delaying the rule change related to specific learning disabilities, especially. I'm a parent of three children, two of whom are living with disabilities, including learning disabilities. As a parent, I know firsthand this rule change would have changed the trajectory trajectory of my own son and stop the increasing stress and isolation he faced due to the lack of appropriate intervention and identification of his learning disabilities. As an advocate, I support families in many different buildings and districts across Vermont, and I have seen multiple children just in the last couple of months be denied eligibility due to not having enough measures to show a severe discrepancy. These children are often viewed as a behavior problem, and while their disruptions clearly come from the frustrational level work and their learning disabilities, their behavior is what they are given support for. By treating behavior as the only lens we view these children struggling with, we set them up for stigmas and stress that impact their ability to access their education, as well as their overall sense of self. I briefly testified to the House Education Committee on this bill before they passed the bill out of committee, and I'd like to briefly share my thoughts again with all of you. It makes me sad and disappointed to hear such a focus on the stress and preparation of districts and educators and not hear more intentional focus on our children living and struggling with potentially unidentified disabilities. Even if I thought the delay was appropriate, it would be really helpful to feel like the focus on this shift is not just based on the comfort and needs of the professionals. Our children and students with disabilities must be at the forefront of our discussion and should not be left unspoken about. As a member of various groups and councils, I know firsthand some of the amazing work being done over the last year to help prepare for this by Jackie Kelleher and her team at the AOE. They are available and able to provide the techn technical to support to those in need of it before July. And I hope this committee has, or obviously you just said you would, be hearing from her and her team directly on how they have and can support districts and educators without delaying this change. The risk of over-identifying should not and cannot be greater than the potential to help those with real needs sooner. If we are providing comprehensive and quality evaluations and interventions, this change shouldn't feel so overwhelming to those who already have the knowledge and the ability to make this shift. And for those who need the support, the AOE is prepared and ready to support them with the technical assistance, and we should give them the opportunity to lead this work on the current timeline. Someone recently told me, told myself and a fellow advocate that we are privileged by our level of knowledge and the access we have to those in the system and the leadership positions. Now, full disclosure, as someone living with a disability myself, with two sons living with disabilities and a family that struggles financially, I've never seen myself as privileged in that way before. But they weren't totally wrong. I do spend a lot of time in many meetings for students across the state. And what that has taught me is there are many children who are not being identified who are struggling with other identified needs that are being ignored by the current structure. And I wish that the families I work with had a stronger voice in this room, but even getting myself a voice today was challenging. Please do not think that this is a minor issue. It really isn't, and it shouldn't be delayed specifically for one group to the preparation from the field. For those that may remember about two years ago, right around this time before COVID, I was testifying about the rule changes in dyslexia. And I was very emotional because I had just learned through an independent evaluation my son had profound learning disabilities that hadn't been appropriately identified or supported from kindergarten until seventh grade. Had there been less reliance on a discrepancy model, it would have been fully identified and his behaviors in isolation, as I mentioned, would have been much less. Since that time, my son has made huge gains in reading math 
and writing. And that is due to the collaborative path this team has taken on focusing on strengths and weaknesses rather than just the documentation collected during the assessment and the rigid requirements for eligibility. I share that because I've seen firsthand that we do have many districts and educators who are ready for this change if they aren't the voices you hear in this room, even if they aren't the voices you hear in this room. And we have a team at the AOE who is ready and able to provide technical support and parents who are ready to support their families using the flexibility this change will allow, not only to help identify their children with learning disabilities, but to begin to provide the interventions and supports that will ultimately be needed and to do so before the cost and intensity escalate as the child gets older. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Feller. Uh, any questions at this point? Ms. Chittenden uh, and Ms. Ballard, please feel free to stay on uh, as we continue to hear. We're going to hear from Ms. Chittenden and then we're going to hear from uh, one more witness and have uh, some committee discussion about this. Ms. Chittenden. I'm also having some connectivity issues. Um, for the record, my name is Sandra Chittenden. Um, I just want to say thank you, Chair Champion, and um, all of the Senate um, Ed Committee members um, for taking all of the testimony that you have thus far. I think Katie and Jamie uh, pretty much said everything I was going to say. <laughs> um, and the only thing that I would add um, that as a special ed advocate, um, I'm seeing many children that are being denied IEPs because of this discrepancy model. Um, and it's a huge issue for their self-esteem, their self-worth, their self-confidence. It causes behavioral problems within the school environment um, and, and at home, socially. Um, you know, kids are really struggling. We're coming out of a pandemic. Um, I know that, um, you know, teachers have had a lot on their plates, um, but Vermont is essentially not in compliance with the IDEA. Um, SLD requirements. Um, there are some districts that are already doing this model and some districts who plan on doing this July 1st, 2022. Um, and uh, my own daughter, when she was in kindergarten, didn't qualify for an IEP, although she had all the characteristics of dyslexia and dyscalculia. And once she got to third grade, she did qualify, but she only qualified for math because of the discrepancy model. And she was able to receive related services for the reading, but she still didn't qualify under SLD for reading, although she had dyslexia. And she, you know, she didn't receive appropriate intervention until fourth grade. And luckily her dyslexia was mild. Um, but her dyscalculia is not, and she still hasn't closed those gaps um, with her basic math computation. And it takes four times the amount of money to um, remediate these children when they're not remediated early as in you know kindergarten, first and second grade. Um, so I would really like um, the committee to, um, really think about the effect that it's going to have on the children in delaying it another year, given where we are and how far these kids, um, you know, are already behind. So uh, thank you for allowing me to give testimony this afternoon. Absolutely. Thank you for taking the time to provide us with the testimony. Uh, any questions or comments at this point from Ms. Chitna? Again, feel free to stay right on uh, as we continue our conversation. Ms. Price, thanks for joining us from the Vermont Family Network. I don't think we've had you in committee yet this year, so welcome. Uh, eager to hear well, your thoughts. Well, thank you then for inviting the Vermont Family Network to testify today on each 716. BFN is the federally designated parent training and information PTI Center in Vermont. PTIs are required by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and we exist in every state. BFN, at VFN, we have been supporting families of children with disabilities for more than 30 years. Our Family Support Program operates a helpline where we respond to families who call us when they have concerns and questions about their child from early learning through transition to adulthood. Special education eligibility and evaluation has been the primary reason for many of our helpline calls. 
I have submitted written testimony to this committee um, a couple of weeks ago, and I will not duplicate that information today. But I will merely repeat that VFN opposes any implementation delay of the 2360 rules regarding adverse effect and specific learning disabilities. I hope to proffer some additional insight today. In April 2015, the Agency of Education convened a stakeholder group to inform and review a guidance document that will provide greater consistency across the state and provide interpretations from the AOE for areas not explicitly identified and generally misapplied within the special within the current adverse effect rule. This was an acknowledgement that schools had struggled with interpreting and applying adverse effect for many years. In addition, when IDEA was reauthorized at the federal level in 2004, there was clarification that educational performance consists of both academic and functional performance. But the Vermont special education rules only listed academic skill areas when considering eligibility for special education. When the state rules implementing the 2004 changes were being promulgated 18 years ago, advocates and families asked to address the adverse effect criterion. We were told there was insufficient time to address this and that there would be opportunity to do so at a later date. Nothing happened. The Vermont rules were revised again in 2009 and in 2012, that's 10 years ago. Again, we asked to address concerns about the adverse effect criterion. Again, we were told there was insufficient time and were promised an opportunity to address adverse effect after that round of rule revisions were completed and nothing happened. Without that needed rule change, the stakeholder group of 2015, of which VFN was a member, worked into 2016 to provide guidance and training so that special education teams would consider the effects of functional deficits on academic skills when determining special education eligibility. This in effect made determination of special education eligibility even more convoluted. Removing the current operational definition of adverse effect has the potential to greatly simplify the eligibility process for educators. It will bring Vermont into conformance with the federal definition of educational performance, which remember came from the 2004 IDEA reauthorization. This will also shift the focus onto what we call the third gate of special education eligibility, which is to assess the child's need for services. This will help children. So some situations we know of from families who have called us, whose children were not considered eligible for special education services under the current definition of adverse effect. Teachers at the school tell me my child is too bright to qualify for special education. She has no friends. I see her not participating appropriately or even at all during circle times. Sometimes she sits outside the group, paying attention to a completely unrelated object. Even in group projects, the other children ignore her suggestions. She's often confused by the activity going on in the classroom and doesn't understand what to do. Another example, I get called two to three times a week to pick my child up from school for all sorts of behavior issues. Sometimes he defies the teacher or he disrupts the class by being loud. He distracts other students. I'm starting to think his teacher hates him and uses the first opportunity to send him home. I can't keep my job if I have to leave so often to bring him home. Yet when I ask the school for help, they say he is too bright to qualify for special education. We often hear from parents that they are discouraged from requesting a special education evaluation because these are too small. Without social skills instruction or behavior plans, Children's communication skills and behavior can continue to deteriorate until they fail their academic classes through their inability to access their education, thereby finally qualifying for special education. But we don't want our kids to have to fail over and over again before receiving help. Vermont has one of the highest rates of students who qualify for special education in the emotional disturbance disability category. One of the possible reasons for this is when an underlying learning disability is not diagnosed and remediated 
the child exhibits behavioral challenges through embarrassment and frustration. They then qualify for special education. But a behavior plan is not a substitute for appropriate instruction. Early identification through implementation of the new rules will get our students the help they need in a timelier fashion. Informal refusals to evaluate are another barrier many families face. A school may report that they have processed all the parents' requests for special education evaluations in a timely fashion resulting in almost all the children qualifying and receiving special education services. What you have heard repeatedly are the parents who are told orally that their children will not qualify and that they should not bother to request an evaluation. If a parent does not submit a request for a special evaluation in writing to the appropriate school administrator, there is no record of one being requested. Under the new rules regarding specific learning disabilities, districts will no longer use the discrepancy model for eligibility, but instead determine whether the student responds to scientific research-based intervention. Response to intervention, RTI, and multi-tiered systems of support, MTSS, have been part of the education landscape long before the pandemic. I went through my records and I saw that in 2009, VFN, in partnership with the Agency of Education, then the Department of Education, developed a booklet entitled Response to Intervention, a Guide for Parents. I do have a link to that in my written testimony that um, I have submitted. This was to help parents' an understanding of RTI so they could work in partnership with schools. This booklet was done 13 years ago. Children with disabilities have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. More than ever, our children need earlier identification and intervention. They have already suffered through two years of disrupted schooling. Further delay of the new rules will penalize them further. Please make the right decision and prioritize the needs of Vermont's most vulnerable children. Please implement the 2360 rules in their original time frame. So thank you. Thank you, you Ms. Price. Any questions or comments for Ms. Price at this point? Thank you all for joining us. We very much appreciate it. Uh, this is very helpful and we hope you'll follow our work as we continue to make uh, work on this decision. Committee, uh, this is certainly a decision point. I think when I look back to who we heard from that really wants to delay, I believe it was the Vermont Principal Association Superintendents Association, is that accurate? They supported the delay, but it seemed like they were supporting others that were ask, asking for the delay, more than that. Who was really around. pushing for this early on? I know no, it's just it's staying in my mind. Just so Teachers, educators? Yeah, we heard from two special educators that were- Yeah, two yeah. special educators yeah. and the, the school psychologists Association said this up. That's right. Yes, yeah. yeah, Senator Schumann. So I just would really like to know how many schools approximately feel ready for this versus yeah. don't, and also how much time the training is going to yeah. involve over the summer. Well, we'll have the training uh, folks come in tomorrow for about Daphne 15 minutes, I would say. Uh, and, um, and that should hopefully give us a sense of what this actually looks like. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm inclined not to to really push this out, but we'll continue to hear from folks. I'm not in favor of the delay. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's where I am right now. It's going to affect so many students, so many moment. kids. Yeah. So I'm trying to remember when we acted on the rules. I think it was in the fall, and I I think one of the problems is that this has been a very difficult time mm -hmm. for everyone. So seeing something new and different and having to restructure the way you do things is probably overwhelming. So, but I agree that um, maybe the summer will be a time for people to catch up yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And let's see what the training looks like. Yeah. And we'll do that yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. The other decision point that we're going to be working a little bit on tomorrow is PCDs. And just uh, that's another thing that the House has sent us that is asking for a two year delay. And we need to start to point whether or not the house includes to get two years. Oh, I'm sorry. They are sending us something that uh, will have a two year delay. I believe they want to get two year testing delay. done. 
they uh, want, it was, uh, colleagues will recall we had Peter Walk and others in asking for it. Their intention is to send it over on our miscellaneous education bill. So we could either, uh, we get it back, strip it out if we don't agree, uh, or reconfirm it in our in our document when we send their miscellaneous education bill. So another decision point. Anything else? Center lines before we adjourn. So I'm looking at Graham's um, memo mm -hmm. answering questions. And um, I don't see anything in here that would say that we can't put money aside for a school support fund. Fine. Yeah. And I so if we're saying delay, let's not delay until we know if we can't do something like that. Right, right, right. Yeah, I agree. We're also continuing a little bit uh later this week on the, the military, three military bills uh that we have. And that I would say will probably be our first vote sometime next week because there's no real reason to delay all of that. Um, we go offline, I think we're done. Uh, Amy is still waiting for No, she's not too Thank you, Doug.